Picture this, you've just spent half an hour thoughtfully filling out an online form like a visa or something like that. And just as you hit that submit button, something goes wrong, the page crashes and you lose all of that hard, hard written text. And it's kind of a nightmare situation that I've definitely been in myself. And I think in the past, uh, what I've done in reaction to that is kind of become extremely frustrated, um, go through all of the stages of grief and eventually just try and recreate the text that I've, I've written this time, maybe be more careful to copy it somewhere before I hit submit. Um, but there is another way. And uh, in fact, there are several different ways. And this is what this video is all about. It's about how can, how can you get yourself out of situations like that? And it's not only text, of course, there's many different things, many different ways that you might want to do this, just data that you have that somehow has kind of <laughs> has lost, has slipped out of your grasp. Uh, so I came across this article the other day um, and it's called Lost Re uh, Recover Lost Text by Core Dumping Firefox. And it's just a short article by JS, uh, j3s.sh and essentially the idea is that you figure out what the process ID of the process is that's crashed, in this case Firefox. You then uh, attach GDB to that process and you dump its uh, you dump its core right you dump all the memory associated with that process, and that's it. And then once you've got that that dumped core, you can just sort of like use standard tools like strings on that on that dump and kind of extract using things like grep to search through. You can extract that text back out, and especially in the case of a web browser or something, you know, most of the time in the moment that that text is is gone. I, it's still in memory somewhere. It's very likely not yet been freed. Um, so, so yeah, that's pretty pretty interesting. And and what I thought when I read this was one, this is really cool. I'm going to do this the next time we get into this situation. But after that, just immediately after that, I started thinking, well, what's going on? Like, why is GDB involved here? Like, do we need GDB to be involved? That's kind of um, it's kind of a weird with dependency, right? Uh, it kind of makes sense, right? GDB is something that can attach to the process and it's a debugger, so it has kind of all these special capabilities, but is it really special? Like, what makes this special? Anyway, so I kind of, I wanted to go on a little journey and just figure out, like, if I could do this just by writing my own program, like, not using GDB. And that's what we're going to do today. We're actually going to write our own program to do this. I'm going to use Python, but you can use anything you want. Um, and yeah, you'll be able to follow the logic, I'm sure, depend uh, did, like despite whichever programming language you will be using. Um, so let's first just get a little example of how this how this works and how it looks. I'm going to zip over to the code here. What I've got is a small C program that I've written. It's called example.c. Um, and it's really simple. What it does is it takes in some strings from from the standard input and it stores them in a couple of different sort of memory locations. So it stores some stuff on the stack, it stores some stuff on the heap um, uh, by using malloc and then we can you know, allocate memory for it. Um, so what we do is we, we grab those strings from the user input and then we simulate crashing the program in some way, like it becoming unresponsive. And uh, the way I simulate that is we, we clear the screen using some, uh, some anti magic and then we simulate a crash by just basically printing that the program has crashed and then we go to sleep for five hours. So it's a pretty good simulation of a crash in the situation you get into. You don't really have a way of getting back to that text. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to, um, I'm just going to run this program example. And here we can enter a string like, hello, this is a stack string. It gets stored. <laughs> on the stack and this one's a heap string so uh, this one is a heap string it was made <laughs> it was made that's actually enough let's do that let's go with that so the program has become unresponsive I'm just going to pop another terminal open here and I'm going to run this program that I've got here called memdump and this is what we're going to write like in a moment. But let's just get a sense of what it's doing first. So I'm going to run memdump. 
uh, .py, and to memdump we need to pass the process ID of the of the program that we're trying to look for. So we can just um, we can work it out using the program pid of. So we're going to say pid of example, and if we run this now. Um, what we can see is that we get a whole bunch of output. It said that it read a whole bunch of stuff and uh, Here on the side we've got a program called uh, or sorry We've got a binary file rather called dump 420364.bin Great name and I'm just gonna open it up in a hex editor and you can see yeah, it's definitely binary data There's a whole bunch of stuff in here and and at this point. I mean it's it's kind of done. You could sort of search for those strings, right? It would be kind of painful to look through this by hand to try and find those strings, but sure you could do it. There's there's stuff in here, right? You can see it. There's the string loading a whole bunch. Oh no, that was probably it loading this into memory. But yeah, there's a whole bunch of um, whole bunch of stuff in here basically. And if we uh, if we take that that memory dump that we now have, and we um, we run strings on it. So let's run strings dump pass that through grep and search for uh, stack here we can see hello this is a stack string it gets stored on the stack you can see that there's also sort of like a partial version of that piece of memory up here we found that in a couple of places and that's kind of typical right programs they tend to have multiple buffers where stuff gets stored so um, you can see right we, we we at least got this and in a crashing situation you may be able to recover at least some of your text, right? That's that's kind of a nice thing. Let's see if we can find the other one. Let's search for heap. So if we search for that one, uh, this this one is a heap string. It was made, and uh, that did just cut off kind of mid sentence because my brain didn't work enough to finish it. But yeah, we got it there. It's in two places. That may or may not mean that it actually was in two memory locations. It could be that simply it was mapped in two places but maybe we'll get to see how that actually works shortly so the next thing to do is i'm just going to delete this um this memdump.py we don't need it we're going to write our own we might as well dump the bin uh get rid of the dump as well um okay uh if you want to look at the full source of this c file i'll include it in the git repository at the end but we don't really need it for now okay so how does this work how are we going to actually make this work because GDB, of course, it's doing its its magic thing. What are we going to do? Well, <clears throat> we're going to tap into something called the PROC file system. And the PROC file system is this really interesting uh, kind of abstraction that is provided by the operating system. So in this case, Linux, but also on BSD, also on Mac, and on a variety of other Unix-derived uh, uh, operating systems. And what it is, is this is this layer that the kernel exposes. Isn't They're not real files inside this quote-unquote file system. They are instead just uh, kind of, uh, yeah, they're sort of objects we can interact with in a file-like way. It's kind of getting into this everything is a file mindset in Unix, which you can Google around for if you want to get an idea about that. So let's have a little visit to the proc file system. So what I'm going to do here is I'm just going to ls of slash proc. And what we can see here in the proc file system is that we have a whole bunch of uh, directories that have numbers associated with them. These are, uh, spoiler alert, these are our processes. This is a, a directory per process and our process ID hooks into these directories. But there are also a whole bunch of other uh, directories available to us and they give us kind of other information about the the well the the wider computer system so we can get like the cpu info which exposes a whole bunch of stuff about the cpu All right if we just cat this file cat cpu info oh, i actually need to do it from slash proc uh, if we just do that uh, we can see that there's a whole bunch of info here about the, the cores of the CPU. And if we uh, look at some of the other things we have here, so there are things to do with devices, DMA, drivers, uh, FB. I assume that's the frame buffer. I don't actually know. Um, uh, there's whole, you know, there's a whole host of information in here. And if you want to learn more about it, right, you can just type in man proc. Uh, and there is a whole bunch of... Um, uh, I don't know if this is this is actually not the proc file system. This is not what I was looking for. Uh, where is that going to be? That's going to be in probably 
in system calls or in I'm not entirely sure what this would be. Oh, special files usually found in dev. It's probably in four. So man s four proc. No. Anyway, you can find the proc. <laughs> you can find the proc entry in man. It is in there somewhere. Um uh, but we're not going to find it now. Okay, so uh, let's let's go into the directory of this process, right? Example's still running over here. It's still unresponsive. It's going to run for the next five hours or so, and hopefully we can figure out how to do that before then. Um, so let's have a look. What's the PID of example? The PID of example is uh, 420364, right? That makes sense. We saw that in the dump. So let's go into slash proc uh, 420 three, six, four. Okay. And what do we have in here? Well, we've got a whole bunch of other files, right? We have um, arch status, we've got auto group, C group, command line, CPU set. There's kind of a whole bunch of information in here about this process. So if, for instance, we were to cat command line, it actually shows us exactly what we use to run this. And that would show us the arguments if we had provided arguments. Um, but in this case, we just ran example. Um, likewise, there is a file here called environment, uh, environ. Uh, if we cat that, it's going to show the environment that this, this process has access to. Um, we can look at things like limits. Uh, we can look at the mount info, uh, the page map. All of this stuff is really interesting, actually. And let's, have, let's uh, cat the status out, in fact. I guess we could do this through less. Um, so if we do this, we can see here the name is example, the state of this process is sleeping. Uh, we've got a TGGID, which is uh, this one, right? That's just our, our process ID. Um, uh, here we have a PPID. We have a tracer PID of zero. We'll see what that means uh, at some point. We can see the, the groups this relates to. We can see a whole bunch of other stuff to do with like... Um, uh, to do with like the VM. So if this was uh, like, this is the virtual memory related stuff, I believe. Um, you can actually see all of this, right? If you actually look up a bunch of the stuff in the, how the proc file system works, you can look up what all of these different values mean and if you can manipulate them um, because it is possible to also interact with this process from here. Um, and in particular, the way in which we could interact with this process, uh, you might have already seen it. There's a file here in the middle called mem um, and that is actually uh, a kind of file representation of that process view of memory, um, which is wild, right? In a way, is there's a file here on the on the system which uh, represents the entire memory space of that process. So you might think, okay, that's easy. We just copy that file and that's it. Except it's not that simple because like I said, this isn't actually a file, like this isn't a file system. So uh, if we try to like just read this, so if I just sort of cat mem, uh, what you'll see is that we get an input output error. And the reason we get an input output error here is because it actually, um, what we just tried to do essentially is read this file from offset zero. And offset zero in the process's memory space is address zero. And that's a null pointer. So we just try to read through a null pointer in that process's memory space. And that's just not allowed. <laughs> that's not something we can do. Um, so the idea is going to be that we're going to read this file somehow, but we need a way to actually figure out where the actual memory addresses that that process is dealing with are so that we can read those, like we can read those addresses in this file, basically. Um, so how do we do that? Well, conveniently, just above it, there is a file called maps. And if we uh, if we look at maps, what we will see is a table that shows kind of what the all the memory mapped stuff in this process is looking like and where it points to and what the permissions are. Of course, uh, if you've been watching the um, the operating system series that I've been running here, or the source dive series where we've been looking at the XV6 operating system, you'll kind of have a good idea about what virtual memory is now, right? So you'll know that these, these addresses, they're not actually real addresses. They're not physical memory, right? There's something called virtual memory and virtual memory is mapped and it's mapped per page. 
So what we have here is kind of the way in which the kernel has set up this process's memory mapped kind of virtual memory space. And we'll be able to see things like the, the permissions and uh, kind of where, where this comes from actually, in fact. So we can see that this is all related to the Python example, the actual, you know, the executable. So it's very likely, you see here it's executable. So this is related very likely to its code, right? If we looked in this place, we'd probably find the assembly code for this process. Um, down here we have the heap. Well, I mean, that's a pretty good indication that this is the heap memory of this process. So that's probably where we'd find our heap string if we look there. And further on, you can see that there's libc down here, uh, which, uh, you know, we can expect to find in a process. Uh, stuff needs to be able to call the C environment. It gets compiled against this, uh, this uh, library. Um, there is the dynamic linker. So this is kind of another thing that we would expect to be part of the system. Here we have the stack. We have a couple more things, but basically you get the point at this point, right? Um, we've got these these addresses. This is the start address. This is the end address, and we've got some permissions here, right? So we've got read, write, execute, and the p. I'm not actually sure what the p means in this context, but it you can find it in the documentation of proc. Um, and the rest is is less interesting for us now, but again, you can find this stuff in there. Um, it's all documented, so. This is it. This is our map. This is our map through the world. So what we're going to do is we're going to read the mem file at this address. And hopefully, well, I mean, specifically, maybe not this piece, but hopefully we'll find what we're looking for in there. So without further ado, let's actually get started, right? So let's uh, navigate back to where we were. Let's kind of dismiss that for a bit and we'll make a new memdump.py. And, uh, and that's it. This is our clean slate. So first things first, let's read this, this file, this quote unquote file. Um, so let's write a function here. This is going to be a uh, read uh, maps file, quote maps info. And uh, we're going to do this like on the process level. So let's take in a process ID here. And uh, yeah, so what do we need to do? We need to figure out the path, the file path. So the file path here is going to be um, slash proc with the PID and the maps file. So that's um, with open uh, the file path as F. And then we can grab all of the, the text out of that. So let's just grab uh, uh, the maps, maps file is f.read and then we should just be able to print the contents of that maps file afterwards. So let's call this function and see if that already does something. And we're going to need to pass it a process ID. And I think what we're going to do is we're just going to get the process ID from the command line. We're going to pass it in, right? Just like I showed in the example. So we'll pass in just the PID. Um, so how can we do that? Well, we need to grab, uh, we need to check the system arguments or the arguments from sys. So import sys and we can say if the length of sys.argv is less than, um, what do we need it to be less than two, I guess. Uh, then we will just print uh, usage Python and the first argument in this is going to be the name of the script. So we'll put that and then this will be the PID of the program and we can exit. So otherwise we can get the PID uh, from uh, sys arg v1. Okay, so let's give this a run. Uh, Python and dump hit of example. Okay, so one uh, missing required positional argument. Well, it would help if we actually passed the PID here, right? It would be really helpful to do that. Okay, so let's try that. Clear. All right, so we got the same file here. So that's working. That's great. All right, so next step then in this read maps info is going to be to kind of split this up line by line 
and pass out the, the pieces that we're looking for. So we're looking for the start address, the end address, and these permissions over here. So let's see if we can't do that. Um, so maps file, we're gonna get that maps file and the, the lines of this file is gonna be the maps file and let's just trim off any white space that may or may not be on the end of the file. So we can do uh, use strip for that and then we can split lines. Um, and then we've got all the lines and what we wanna do is we wanna iterate through each of these lines and basically just grab this stuff. And there are different ways we could do it. I'm gonna tackle this problem with regular expressions because it seems like the best course of action here. So I'm just gonna call this the maps info regular expression. And what do we need, right? So at the start of the string, we're going to capture a group of stuff. In that group of stuff is going to be hexadecimal numbers, and there's gonna be a bunch of them, right? That's gonna capture all of that stuff. Then there's gonna be a literal dash, and we're gonna capture yet another group of hexadecimal numbers. And then there is going to be some sort of space. I think it's just a regular space, but we'll just use the, the space symbol. And then we're gonna capture the next four things, right? These permissions. I guess we really only need three of them. So let's just capture those, one, two, three. And that's it. That's our regular expression. So we're gonna use that per line and we're gonna grab stuff from here. So um, we're going to get a match. Uh, uh, I guess we shouldn't call it match. This will be like, uh, yeah, let's just call it a result for now. So we're going to do re.match. Uh, we're gonna pass in our maps info regular expression, and we need to do this per line. So for line and lines, I'm gonna grab this uh, result for this line, and we have to check if we actually got a result here. So if result is none, um, uh, that's a problem, so we will just raise an exception at this point, saying that uh, we couldn't read maps info online, and then we'll just print the line where we can read that. Otherwise, that means that we did capture this successfully, so it means we got you know all of this information out. So what we can do is we can extract that out using the groups. So now we've got result of groups, we get that, that's gonna give us our, our results back. So that's gonna be a start address and end address and the permissions. Let's just call it perm. All right, and then what we're gonna do with this, these are all still strings. I wanna convert the, you know, the, the uh, start address and end address. I wanna convert them to integers. So we're gonna have our um, this is going to be our map info. For results. What we're going to do is we're going to say info results dot append and we're going to just push like a tuple in here. And I think what we'll do is int start address. That's the base 16 address, the hexadecimal. So we need to pass it as such. Same thing for the end address. And then finally the permissions, we'll just keep them as integers. And when we are done with this function, we will just return our info results. And let's give that a shot, right? So now we're going to just print that, see what we get. Okay, so that is looking perfect actually. Um, we can see that we've got a start address here, an end address and with the permissions, and that's it. That's the inner little tuple. So we have three elements uh, that we can work with. These are numbers. I'm pretty sure they correspond to the hexadecimal. And it looks like we managed to extract all of them. So that's, that's great. That's perfect. Um, so what's next? Now we've actually got the, the maps info. Um, we can uh, we can iterate through each of these and basically figure out if it's memory that we're interested in. And if you think about it, for all purposes, memory that we're interested in is something that's readable and something that's writable because that's data memory, right? You can read and you can write from it. So 
um, typically pages uh, in modern operating systems, they're not going to be like, say, writable and executable unless you really specifically make it that. Um, so read and write pages. If you find a page that's read and write, it's most of the time just going to be a data page and it's going to be some kind of like generic RAM thing, right? It's memory that we can work with. So let's just um, iterate for info, uh, for info, and let's, let's actually just split it apart here. So start address, end address, and bum, and maps info. So each for each one of these, and we should have something. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to check the permissions. So if um, if there's an R in perm and there's a W in perm, well, that's it. That's something we want to deal with. Um, and what we're going to do at that point is we're going to read from this memory file. So we need to open up this memory file. So let's do that with open and the uh, path we're going to use here, of course, is proc slash pid slash um, mem, of course. My brain was melting for a second there. And I'm just going to call that mem so we can read from it as such. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we are going to work out, like, what's the length of this binary blob we're going to read. So blob, blob length is... Um, it is the end address minus the start address. That's how much memory we're going to read. And then we're just going to read that memory. So blob equals mem.read. And actually, we can't just read. We first need to, um, we kind of need to navigate the sort of the virtual cursor inside this file. We need to navigate it to the start address. And the way which we do that is to use um, mem.seek. So seek this is this stuff taps into the like file system calls, um, and seek is uh, something where we can pass a file, an offset, and kind of a, a method, a sort of uh, a sort of starting location for your offset. So we can search from the beginning of the file. We can search from wherever the cursor happens to be inside the file at that point. And we can search from the end of the file. And of course, we want to search from the beginning of the file because that means we can just use the start address. And that kind of makes the most sense to me. So in order to do that properly, uh, we can import OS because OS has a constant for that. So we want to read at the start address and use OS seek. And it's called seek set. As in, we're setting an address to read from. I'm not sure. I'm not sure where the set comes from. But this is the one we need to use in this case. Um, then we're going to read this blob. So we're just going to read blob length bytes from this blob. And then we need to write these uh, this, this memory to a file, right, that we're capturing. So let's open up another file. <laughs> and I guess we need to make sure that we open this for reading as a binary file. Didn't do that. So this time we're going we're gonna to open another file. And it's just going to be in the local environment. And... Let's call this, well, let's use the same naming convention I did in the example program in the beginning. Let's use dump and we'll, we'll chuck in the pid here and we'll just call it .bin. And this is going to be a writable file in, in binary, right? So we're going to write bytes to it. Um, and let's call that the uh, df, the dump file. So indent all of that. And then what we can do is we can do df.write and we can just write that blob. That's it. It's kind of as simple as that, actually. Well, it's not. <laughs> it's kind of not. Um, there is a little bit more to this, actually. And if you think about GDB and GDB, uh, what it can do and kind of its superpower, GDB is a debugger, right? So its whole thing is that it can somehow connect to a process and manipulate that process, kind of take control of it. Um, and uh, the way in which it does that is through a, uh, a kind of an API, a system call API that the operating system provides to us. Um, that's, and this is Unix, uh, Unix based. So it's, you know, it's Linux, it's uh, BSD, it's Mac. And it's called Ptrace. Uh, Ptrace is this kind of, uh, this really interesting system call 
that can be used to basically trace another process, right? To, to be able to kind of get on there and see what's going on inside another process. Um, and it's a very, very powerful tool, in fact. Now, the thing about P-Trace is that in modern systems, like if, if what I just said to you, right, if that somehow like tinkled your, uh, your security bells in your head, the idea of somehow just being able to, just by knowing the process ID of some other process on the system, um, being able to connect to it and look into its memory, if that doesn't sound like a little bit sketchy, then, um, then yeah, you should probably be thinking about security a bit more, to be honest. But yeah, so it, it is a bit sketchy. And, and in fact, in modern operating systems, in, in Linux, there are, there are actually um, safeguards against this. So by default, in most sort of distributions of Linux, when you sort of just come up as a regular user, you actually won't be able to just p-trace other processes by default. Um, typically, you'll only be able to p-trace a process if you're its parent, right? So if you're if you're the program that starts and then you start another program, then usually you can p-trace it. And so that's why sort of doing something with GDB typically works um, because typically GDB does start the process. So there's something to consider there. And I, I think I'm probably right in saying that it you would probably have issues even using the, the method that's described in the blog post, right, by using GDB, because you're connecting to a process that's already running. So there is kind of something to be aware of here. You can, um, you can change the policy of this. And let me just bring up the, um, the terminal here again. We're going to the ptrace manual. Um, so if we scroll down to the bottom, there's a lot of interesting information here. But somewhere along here, we can find um, the, uh, this uh, part that talks about Yama ptrace scope. So what it says here is on systems with the Yama Linux security module installed, i.e. the kernel was configured with config security Yama, um, this file uh, is, can be used to restrict the ability to trace a process with ptrace and thus also the ability to use tools like strace and gdb. Um, the goal of such restrictions is to prevent attack escalation, right? It's kind of, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it's, it's kind of makes sense why you wouldn't want this. But uh, long story short, as root, you can write to this file and you can uh, write it back to classic ptrace permissions, which is that if you kind of happen to be uh, aligned with the process that you're trying to trace in some way, like you have the same UID and all of this kind of stuff, then you can trace it. Now, keep in mind, it is a bit of a security risk to actually turn this on. So one of the other things you can do, because um, typically what will happen is that the default value is set to this, restricted to ptrace. So you can only ptrace something that you're the parent of or you're the root of the system. So if you really want to do this and you don't want to have to worry about like downgrading your permissions, what you can do is just run as sudo this dumping script, and then that will allow you to dump uh, dump the file by ptracing it in a totally legit way that doesn't compromise security because you've escalated your own privilege. But if you want to be able to do this um, as a regular user, as I'm going to do in this demo, and I'm not necessarily recommending that this is what you do, you have to write zero to this file uh, in order to set this um, set this permission basically so keep that in mind and uh, uh you know don't at me and tell me that i'm doing something like insecure here like i'm being very clear i'm not telling you to downgrade your security privileges this is just the simplest thing to show you uh that this is kind of how it works and there's options so okay now with that out of the, mind, uh, out of the way let's just talk a little bit about ptrace and what what it really is and what it means ptrace is this facility that you can do to attach to processes and then do things with them, right? So by attaching to the process, you kind of pause it, that other program's execution and you can do things to it. So one of the things you can do is you can then read its memory. So that's why we will be able to open up this file and read its memory because we're tracing it at that point. So that will then be legitimate for us to do that. Um, other things that you can do is like, you can uh, cause it to step to the next instruction. You can, uh, you can read out of it, its register values, right? In the CPU registers, you can set its register values. You can kind of 
mess around with all of the different things. You can like continue execution until the next um, system call happens. So that's how things like S trace work, right? Um, so it's it's really cool. It's really interesting. And if that if you're thinking, yeah, well, you can build a whole debugger with that. Of course, that that is the point, actually, right? That's how GDB kind of works on the the back back end of it, right? It's the, the it's using ptrace, right? Of course, GDB does a lot more interesting smart stuff in the front end in order to be able to kind of know where your symbols are, to figure out how to turn assembly code back into C code that you have written. So there is a relationship there so that you can step through in the, in the uh, source code. Um, but yeah, kind of when you reduce it down, it's really doing ptrace system calls. So you might be wondering, how can we do system calls in Python? Well, Python actually has a really good foreign function interface to be able to call C C, uh, C libraries and C functions. And that's what we're going to do. We're going to tap into that. So I'm going to import um, uh, from, from this uh, standard library thing, C types. Uh, C types is kind of all our window into this foreign function interface of C. And we can use it actually to create like compatible C structs that we can pass to things to create all the valid types to create things like memory where we can pass, you know, a pointer to some memory that we have in Python. And then we can sort of go between the C world and the Python world this way. It's really pretty cool. Um, and not only C, of course, you can do this with any language that, you know, will will compile down to the C ABI, um, which is quite a lot of stuff as it turns out. Anyway, so what do we need from here? We need something called CDLL and we need a data type that we can wrap stuff up in. And as it turns out, we can do basically everything with this one uh, data type CU long. It's not, uh, so it's not, <laughs> this is an unsigned integer, an unsigned long integer. Um, and what we'll see is that there are you know, like more advanced types for this. <laughs> Uh, but we can wrap them all up in this. So what we're going to do is we're going to open up a library. We're going to actually open up um, libc, right? Libc has got a function for us called ptrace that we can call, and that will make the system call on our behalf. So let's let's make this thing called c ptrace, <clears throat> and we're going to get that by running cdll, and to cdll we pass um, we pass a path. So the path that we're going to pass here is libc.so.6. So six is kind of like the, but you, you might have to adjust this if you have different versions of things, but this is what I have. And then that basically opens up this library if it can be found on the system. And like kind of on this object that we get returned, there's something, there'll be a, a ptrace, right? So there'll be a thing called ptrace. So now we have this, uh, basically what is a function, we can um, annotate it a little bit more and we kind of need to annotate it. So we're going to annotate it with the argument types that we need to pass here. So ptrace is a function that we're going to call in C basically, and it has certain arguments. So let's whip up the man for ptrace again. And what we can see is that, um, yeah, ptrace here is a standard C library thing. Um, so something that's compiled against libc is going to have that. It's in the ptrace header. So if we want to read the ptrace header, we'd be able to find like all the information about this. And we can see that this is what the function is, right? So it returns a long um, assigned integer and it takes in a ptrace request. So there's actually an enum called ptrace request that has a fixed number of different operations we can do. Uh, then it takes in a PID and then it takes in a void pointer to an address and a void pointer into some data, right? So we can do different operations on ptrace. Um, and uh, basically this is like the core of two things and this like address and data, this is dependent on the operation that we end up doing this request. All right, so let's see if we can like kind of mock that up based on what we know. So what's the type of this gonna be? Well, the enum, we can actually uh, sort of um, alias that to a, to a CU long, an unsigned long integer. Um, the uh, process ID, which was, uh, if you saw it here, was of type PID T, so it actually has its own type, but we can also alias that to CU long. Um, the void pointer, CU long, 
and uh, the void pointer to data, also a CU long. So great, we've we've sort of <laughs> we've sort of got our uh, our argument types there. Now we need to define our um, return type, and that's called the res type, the result type. And uh, yeah, what's it going to be? Well, we saw it was a long. So if I, we actually want to do this properly, we would do like C long. And um, why don't we, in this one case, do this one properly? So it's going to return a C long. So that's going to be a signed integer, which indicates whether or not this operation was successful. OK, so that's kind of all the setup we need to do in order to be able to call this function. We can already call ptrace uh, by doing this, right? If we just call ptrace and pass in our arguments, that will already work. But what I want to do is I want to wrap this up into a little Python function called ptrace. And to that, we will take in, well, they call it the request. So let's follow that and the PID. And they're just going to be like regular Python values. Like uh, this will be a number of some kind and this will be a number. And so the request, as it turns out, um, and you can find this if you actually go and look at those headers that is references in the manual, you can find out that on Linux, the, um, the request for attaching to a process turns out to be the number 16. And the request for detaching from a process that turns out to be number 17. Now, there are a whole list of things that you can do. So these are just two of the operations, but they're the only ones we'll need for now. So what we're going to do is we are going to, uh, that's our request. Let's actually wrap these up already into a, uh, into a C U long so that we can just use these directly in the code. And we need to wrap up the PID. So let's call this the C PID is going to be a C U long PID. So what the, what we're actually doing here is we're wrapping these up into like C types. So that's why this whole thing is called C types. We're, we're kind of mapping this Python world into the world of C so that we can interact with its functions. So we're going to grab this um, C PID then what I will do is to simply call the ptrace function now. So we're going to call ptrace and we're going to call with the request with the C PID. And these other two arguments, well, we need to do something with those and uh, they're both, they're both just going to be null. So that's actually just uh, the idea of calling C U long with, um, with zero, making the same mistake here again could create a variable called null that would work. And in the end, we're just going to be able to return the, the value from this, right? So this is going to return something and it's going to be that status of whether it was successful or not. So that's it. Now we have a ptrace function. We can actually go over here. And before we actually open up the mem file, we can call ptrace with ptrace attach and the pid. And we actually need to wrap this PID. It's right. It's a string right now because we got it from the command line. So we need to um, wrap it up into an integer. And then at the end, we are going to uh, detach from the process. OK, there we go. That is uh, that's it. That's actually all we need to do. So this is pretty cool. Like. Um, I don't know if you know, a lot of people know about this because they'll they'll interact in certain ways. And especially if you write libraries, you'll probably be well aware of this. But I think a lot of Python programmers don't actually know that you can do this kind of uh, foreign function interface so easily. Um, so yeah, you really can. You can just crack open uh, a library and call into its functions. It's really cool. Um, so yeah, that's what we've done here. So let's see if we can't make this work now. So example program is still run. It's still unresponsive. Um, let's run Python memdump. If we run that, we get our usage. So we need to provide our PID. And of course, we'll use PID of example. And well, we didn't see any text. There was no output. There was nothing. But we do have a dump uh, file there. So let's run strings on it. Let's run strings on our, on our dump. Um, we'll grep for the word stack. And there you go, we've got the same results. Again, this is a stack string, it gets stored on the stack. Let's do the same for the heap, not the heapo. Uh, 
this one is a heap string. It was made. Great, fantastic. So this is uh, this is what we can do. And of course, if you don't want to do all of that kind of security related stuff, like turning off the ability to trace a process arbitrarily, you would just run this with sudo, right? Uh, so that's how you would do that in your own system. And that's it. And this ha really has the advantage of the fact that you actually pause execution on the program that you're tracing at the time, which means that you kind of limit the chance that that program will clear up that memory sort of as you're doing things, right? For a, for a process like Firefox, if you've got a lot of tabs open, um, it, it can take a while to dump the memory and you can end up having like a gigabyte file because, you know, Firefox can have gigabytes of memory allocated for itself. So... Um, yeah, just keep that in mind. And that's kind of one of the, the nice things about that. All right. I hope this has been kind of enlightening for you. And um, yeah, like I don't want to give the impression that any of this is like uh, production ready or something like that. I mean, what is a production system where you're dumping memory from something? But um, of course, like if you want to do ptrace properly and you want to go further with this, there is actually a library out there called Python ptrace. It does all of this stuff. If you go and look at the code, it's really well written and it works for all different operating systems and you can do much, much more than just what we're doing here. Uh, so that's kind of, you know, that's something. And if you're kind of interested in this idea about the proc file system and kind of like that idea of the operating system extending all of this control and information to us via files, um, yeah, you should do a little bit more research. There's a lot to learn there and there's a lot of interesting material. Um, so yeah, I hope you kind of find your own little rabbit hole in all of this. I hope you've learned something. You know, leave me a comment below if you do something cool based on this or if you've had some ideas or if you think I've done something wrong. Just let me know. Um, I'm open to learn more. I hope you are too. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, video and I'll see you next time.